welcome everyone to this annual folks event of the 92nd Street Y, Law of the Land. I can tell you five years ago when we came up with this idea, it never occurred to us that anyone would care. Uh, uh, yeah, it was like, and I for one was very skeptical. <laughs> Trevor, I think, had more thoughts, more ambition about this. But I, I said, who would want to come for this? You know, and what we've learned, <laughs> this is one of the more, well, it's been wildly popular over the last five years. I was telling Mark this before. He said, that's a good thing to know. That, in fact, every year people remember this. They download it on, on demand. Uh, they talk about it. They want to know when it's happening the next year. So thank you for joining us yet again for Law of the Land. I think that it is fascinating. The Supreme Court is, there's mystery in it. Everything about it is mysterious. And I think that what happens with the way we run it here is that, you know, you hear the Supreme Court decisions being announced throughout the month of June. And even though you see Ariane on television and read Mark and Andrew, uh, everyone still has lots of questions. You know, they have reason, they keep reading and they think, you know what, folks will explain it to them. <laughs> and that's why they're here. So thank you. Uh, we are joined uh, every year, you know, uh, we change our uh, legal journalists, our Supreme Court reporters. The only uh, permanent guest is the dean of NYU Law School, uh, Trevor Morrison. The truth is, he really knows this stuff better than we do. I mean, you know, he, we write about this stuff, but he really knows this. He's, he says he's running the law school, but he's really reading the cases. He loves that. And so he's here with us, but we're joined by Andrew Chung from Reuters. Uh, <clears throat> and our friend Mark Stern from Slate. and the wonderful Ariane DeVogue from CNN. So let's start, uh, there's so much to talk about. Uh, you may remember last year, uh, we did this on the night that President Trump announced his appointment wow. of Kavanaugh. We did it on this night. So what we did is we, we uh, televised the, the, uh, the announcement from here to make sure that people didn't go home. Uh, and, and <laughs> because there was that much intrigue. So the qu one question I wanna ask is, uh, a year later, even that night, we had no idea what that confirmation hearing would look like. Um, I'm amazed that we went through that, and then the next thing you know, the Supreme Court was in business as if nothing had happened. And I'm wondering whether a year later, some of you, one of you, have some insights about what we learned from that experience, and did anything happen during the year in any of these decisions that makes you think, well, you know, that had been a direct bearing in this confirmation hearing and that somehow it got unnoticed uh, in this opinion. So anyone, Andrew, you wanna start? I mean, I, sure, I'll start. I, I guess my answer would be no to your last question. I think uh, Justice Kavanaugh came onto the court after this incredibly controversial, contentious confirmation. Andrew, a little closer to you. Sorry, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Um, and he, he got onto the court and it was basically like nothing happened. Like he, he comported himself with, uh, you know, he, he was composed on the bench, he was easy with the other justices, he often sort of bantered with uh, the justice right beside him, Alina Kagan. Um, you really couldn't detect uh, from his demeanor that uh, something as, you know, transformative as what happened during the confirmation hearing had actually occurred. Um, I mean, it, his jurisprudence has, has sort of played out as expected. He's, he is, uh, most pe observers thought he would be quite conservative, more conservative than the justice that he replaced, Anthony Kennedy, uh, and he has been. Um, he but he voted with the majority. This is incredible. I just read this 91% of the time. He's like trying to win a popularity contest. And you mostly, know, he's with the, mostly with the chief. Yeah. Mostly, right, mostly with the chief. I think that they were, what, 94% voted together. But 91% of the time, he was with the majority. I mean, is that, how unusual is that? Is that unusual? Does anyone know? Is that unusual? I know, Trevor, you clerked for the Supreme Court. Is that unusual for a, for a, a newly appointed justice? Or we'd say, no, no, we would expect that a newly appointed justice would get along with everybody. Well, um, I don't, I don't know the statistics on how often um, each member of the court in their first year voted with the majority, but I think we have to be careful with that statistic. So if there's a fairly stable majority in either direction on the cases where the court is likely to be divided, then the only real question is whether the new member of the court is likely a member of that majority or is likely in dissent. Um, if Justice Kavanaugh 
uh, as has been observed so far, is more likely to be in the majority of a conservative-leaning decision than what that 91% figure tells you is that most of the closely divided cases this year leaned conservative as opposed to liberal. And then there are a bunch of cases that weren't closely divided where either everyone on the court agreed or it was, or it was an overwhelming supermajority. So that by itself, I think, prob to me, tells you more about the relative stability at this point of this newly emerging uh, majority that's, that's much more likely to lean right than left on the Roberts Court. Not in every case, um, not in every vote that Justice Kavanaugh cast, and he, um, he certainly cast some votes um, this year that, that leaned more um, with the liberal justices than the conservative, um, but I think mostly what this is telling us is that we have a court with some very easily identifiable voting blocks mm. at this point. Ariane? Well, you know, we were talking about last year at this time, and I think that one of the most obvious changes we've seen now is the role of Chief Justice John Roberts, who for so many years was in the shadow of Anthony Kennedy on those cases that most capture the public's attention, right? Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, uh, Kennedy has retired, and you have John Roberts now, and he is uh, the most important vote, and he's juggling two things. He's juggling the institution of the court on one hand, but he's also juggling his conservative jurisprudence, and his feet are on the pedals, and he now, instead of Kennedy, is going to determine how fast and how far this court turns to the right. He suddenly has uh, this central role, and uh, that's the biggest change, I think, since last term. And the speculation a year ago that, in fact, it might be Roberts who would become the swing vote uh, and replace Kennedy, has that come to pass? Is that part of what it means to have his foot on the pedal in restraining the amount of the degree to which we, we lean right? Well, the thing is, is when you say swing vote, you suggest a, a, a jurisprudence where sometimes you're with the liberals and sometimes you're with the conservatives. So I hesitate to use the word swing vote for Roberts. I think much more likely he is maybe the deciding vote in so many of these cases, but his balance here is between uh, the court and his vision and the institution and his own, uh, the way he sees the law. And so that's why he has become just uh, so critical. And yeah. I, I would also say I think a, a swing vote, at least to me, is someone who sometimes swings left and sometimes swings right. And that was Justice Kennedy. Love him or hate him, when he swung left, he swung left big, right? <laughs> Obergefell, marriage equality nationwide, didn't flinch, clearly loved writing that opinion. Using words like human dignity. It, he, uh, equal <laughs> dignity. For, he was right. having fun, right. right? And that was an undeniably progressive decision. When he swung right, ooh, he swung far right. Mm -hmm. Citizens United, right? Really just accomplishing these chief goals of the conservative movement. And so he ended up infuriating everyone, but he did really swing. Chief Justice Roberts doesn't swing like that. He either swings really far to the right or he swings right to the center and maybe an inch to the left. And he will give <laughs> liberals crumbs and then leave them begging for more. And he's not going to give them any more. He's given them all that he thinks they deserve. He'll give them this tiny qualified win in, say, the census case, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. And they all say, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. We're so grateful, Mr. Chief Justice. And then he's going to turn around and screw them. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's not going to then g g deliver more big left-wing wins for progressives. It's not going to happen. So he's not going to end up being the suitor of his generation. No. Right? Did, where, peop where people are going to say, can you believe that they pick this guy as a conservative? That's never going to happen. But well, that was said after the individual mandate. That's what I thought. Right, you're saying, but it's not enough to carry the day. It's not said very often. <laughs> but this term, I mean, in addition to the census case, he did sort of, you know, have the, 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 the swing vote in... Uh, stopping the asylum um, plan in, for the Trump administration, and also, um, you know, he was Louisiana with, abortion and yeah. the Louisiana abortion case, and yeah. you know, also uh, a, an agency power deference case, which is sort of in the weeds. There's a, there is just this. I agree with this point about you have to be careful with the term like swing justice, just to give a little more historical context in that. Um, I think we could think back to at least the time of Lewis Powell being on the court, um, where 
Institute in terms of predecessors playing this role of the middle justice. Justice Powell was that uh, during the Burger Court years. Um, and then Justice O'Connor, really, yes. even though she, her service on the court overlapped many, many years with Justice Kennedy, during her time on the court, she was really the middle justice in a great many cases. <clears throat> but if you contrast O'Connor with Kennedy and now with Roberts, you can see just what, how different that role can look. With Justice O'Connor preferred um, middle ground decisions. And so when she was the deciding vote, she often sought a way to decide the case uh, as specific to its facts as possible in a way that kind of gave something to either side. Think of the way she cast her votes in the University of Michigan affirmative action cases back in 2003, upholding one plan, striking the other one down. It's really a kind of middle position. Justice Kennedy wasn't that sort of justice. I think you've got it exactly right. Um, he was often the deciding vote, but then he would be the author for a very aggressive opinion at one end or the other mm -hmm. of the, the ideological spectrum, if you want to put it that way. I don't think Justice Roberts is going to be like either of those two. I think there's a set of commitments that he seems to have that are clearly held in good faith and deeply believed and that he is a very powerful exponent of that are identifiably conservative and that will guide his votes in most cases. And then there's a small set of cases that he apparently seems to view as putting the court's institutional legitimacy into play in an unusual way. And it's in those cases, perhaps alone, where he might cast a slightly different kind of vote. Mm -hmm. But that's not a <clears throat> deciding justice or a swing justice across the board. Before we get to some of these cases, Ariane, I wanted to ask you, as we talked about this before, you had said or you had written before the last election that you thought we were moving left, that you were seeing a movement left, and then the last election changed everything. So can you explain, because this is, we've gone, this is a complete 180, right? You were, at the time, thinking, in fact, I think you even said that you thought that liberals were disappointed in the Garland nomination because he wasn't progressive enough, right? And boy, do we wish that would have not happened, right? Well, um, I don't cover politics, so the night <laughs> of the election, I was tasked with the next day saying what would happen uh, in the court, and I had been watching. I had been watching over the summertime with surprise that I felt like the progressives um, were sort of letting uh, Merrick Garland. It, it just didn't come up. You know, weeks passed, and it was the campaign, and of course, I don't cover politics, and I think, why isn't this coming up? You're saying this should have been an issue, well, that they had done this to us. Why was, no, but, no, I, why aren't they talking about Judge Garland and, right. and getting on the court? It just wasn't on the campaign trail, and I know that some progressives um, thought that uh, if uh, Hillary Clinton were to win, maybe there should be somebody, an, an, another nominee, but what I was really struck with is it wasn't a part it didn't come up a lot on the campaign trail. So there I was thinking in my head, okay, I want to write a piece on the morning of the election about where this court is headed. And I was all set to do that. And I remember I went to <laughs> Starbucks uh, <laughs> and I came back in because we have an entire political team. And they said, whoa. And my first thought, because uh, it was going to be a long night, is I got to start writing. <laughs> <laughs> I have to write now right. what this court could be um, with the change here. So mm -hmm. I guess I, I do feel struck that uh, that it wasn't um, it wasn't a big part of the uh, campaign. And when you saw how Donald Trump handled it when he was a candidate, no other presidential candidate has ever um, put forward a list of potential nominees when he didn't have the nomination. That was extraordinary. I mean, you had a list, and he was thinking about that uh, quite early. So uh, that really struck mm. me. M Mark, I want to ask one question to you, because I know we've talked about this. Uh, should people be surprised that Kavanaugh was as conservative or not as conservative as that they feared? Um, uh, unless Susan Collins is in this room, then <laughs> no, no one should be surprised <laughs> because his record on the D.C. Circuit was extremely conservative. Uh, there was nothing in his jurisprudence to indicate that he would be a suitor or frankly even really a Roberts in the sense that he had this deep overriding concern for institutional legitimacy. He is an aggressive ideological conservative and almost as soon as he joined the court, he did his best 
best in almost every case, with a few exceptions we will talk about, to push it far to the right. And uh, he has, in, in just less than a full term on the court now, he has really, I think, overridden a fair amount of Justice Kennedy's legacy uh, of moderation and leftward swings, and he's prepared to do even more in the future. He is the staunch conservative that most people thought he was, uh, that some of his defenders pretended he wasn't, but that we all really knew he was. Let's talk about the census case. Can someone explain this to me? Uh, we've, if you haven't been following the news today, uh, the question is now moot. Uh, the Justice Department, the Commerce Department has withdrawn the question. Uh, the Supreme Court essentially had told the, the Trump administration, the Commerce Department, through Justice Roberts, go back and come up with a better answer. Remember, this is the case in which the Commerce Department decided to include a census question. One had not been included since 1950. Uh, the Founding Fathers were really, really interested in how many actual people were living in the United States. They weren't focused on whether they were citizens or not, so it's a question whether you ever really had to have the question, although in the past they have had it. They decided to revive it during this sort of, the, the Trump administration, there was understandable concern that with the, the, the atmosphere of immigration as we have it, uh, that Hispanics, minorities, the undocumented would not respond to the question, and they would be uncounted, and by uncounted, it would affect certain seats, it electoral college, funding, uh, and so therefore this went to the Supreme Court, um, and now the Supreme Court had said to, uh, to the Justice Department, said to the Commerce Department, look, your answer before was pretext, we didn't buy it, uh, come up with a better answer. Now why, I mean, it seemed to me that Justice Roberts had given the Trump administration an invitation. Just go there and give me a better answer and we'll approve it now. He didn't say you couldn't ask the question. They just said you didn't give us a good answer for why you wanted to include the question. Give us a good one. So why did they now retract the whole question altogether? Why would they do that? Who wants to take that first? I mean, this is really a political question too, I guess, right? I mean, we were having this discussion earlier. I, I, I mean, it's anybody's guess, I suppose, but probably one hypothesis is, is the, the deadlines involved were very compressed. Um, from from the get-go, uh, most of the citations for the deadline was the end of June, and that's what the, you know, the Solicitor General and the government had uh, mostly represented as being the deadline, and, and Justice Roberts m noted that in, in his opinion. I mean, there was some ambiguity in, in, in the sense that, depending on which side you were on and, and how it would benefit you. Uh, some people argued that, in fact, the Census Bureau could, uh, with additional resources, meaning lots more money, they could um, delay the printing of the forms until uh, October. Uh, and so when, so when, the, when Justice Roberts uh, blocked the question, it was, it, was a, it was, you know, people were wondering whether they could come back with a non-contrived answer, quote unquote, um, and uh, somehow make it through uh, the iterations in lower courts, uh, notwithstanding that there are other things going on in lower courts, like sanctions motions in the New York case, the, the equal protection issue in the Maryland case, uh, how all that would play out even uh, before October. So, I mean, I think the best guess would be the government just realized that there just was not enough time uh, to do this, even by October. Oh, yeah? But I, I happen to have the opinion with me because I had to write the last iteration of my story in the cab <laughs> <laughs> on the way here. And I think what's interesting about it is that keep in mind that the Solicitor General, Noel Francisco, he went to the Supreme Court and he said, we want you to look at this question on an expedited basis because this thing's got to be printed in June. So you've got that. Mm -hmm. Solid, right? As and if then, to say, I'm on record of telling you the urgency that you have to do it now. Right, and then you have suddenly the president in the last couple of days saying, uh, well, I think I want to delay. That's, that's mm -hmm. two different messages, right? But then you also have, I mean, Roberts, in this opinion, which was a bear in the first few minutes to understand <laughs> uh, what happened, it was, it was crazy. Um, but in this opinion, Roberts doesn't say you can't, do it ever. He just really zeroes in on the government's rationale. And all along, the government had said, we are doing this to better comply with the Voting Rights Act. And here's what he says in this opinion. Uh, he says, uh, 
And unlike a typical case in which an agency may have both stated and unstated reasons for a decision, here, the Voting Rights Act enforcement rationale, the sole stated reason, seems to have been contrived. So he's basically saying, go back and do it again. You know, what's your rationale? But in here, there's a lot that says that there is discretion. But that sentence sure tells me that the only thing you talked about was the Voting Rights Act. Which would make me dubious if you came up with something else. Well, it's, you know. So if you, I think that's right. Um, and my guess at this point also is that the sort of practicalities of timing um, dictated the decision. The Solicitor General did represent a seemingly fixed nature of, of the deadline and the absence of some commitment of extraordinary resources. And the question, I guess, would be, can extraordinary resources be committed? And um, what would it look like even to try? And the difficulty there is supposing you even could figure out, okay, we think we have six months more if we, if we just allocate way more resources to the effort. There wouldn't be any way to know today that the litigation on remand and the ensuing inevitable appeals would be finished six months from now. Mm -hmm. And so there is a kind of problem. I, I, I haven't thought this through. I don't know, if this were, if this were a matter of absolute first urgency for the nation, where there was no real resource constraint, um, I suppose you would just right now decide to print two versions of the census, mm -hmm. and you would let the litigation play out and tell you which one you were allowed to use. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know why that's not been contemplated, except that it would be a certain waste of money. Paper. Um, a lot of money. Uh, a, a, a lot, lot of money. Yeah. Um, but I'm not positive that government never makes decisions <laughs> of that kind of waste. Um, I, I, I do agree with, with, um, with the way you've described the case. It's, it's a very specific holding by Justice Roberts yeah. to focus on pretext alone. He does not agree with Judge Furman's comprehensively reasoned opinion at the district court level mm -hmm. that the decision was substantively arbitrary and capricious, which is the standard under the Administrative Procedures Act. To have affirmed Judge Furman on that ground as well would have made it much more difficult, even if there were lots of time. But just by saying they cited a reason that we disbelieve, Chief Justice Roberts came one half step away from saying the administration lied. Um, it leaves open the possibility of not lying. And the thing here is, <laughs> I think it's almost certain that just the Chief Justice Roberts would be a vote as a part of a majority that would have upheld the census if it had been defended on the ground that the government wants to give states the option to decide whether to draw district lines on the basis of um, voting age citizens as opposed to persons, which is the thing that the administration has been accused of wanting to do. You're saying just, tell, up to just tell the truth. Would have, by my reading of Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, would very likely have been legally sufficient. Well, this makes me think. Now the clock's been run out, it appears. Right. Well, this makes me think we should talk about this next Roberts' opinion. This is the gerrymandering case. Mm. Because even though we could say that the census case is moot, it does seem that if you looked at both of those decisions together, they seem to be an attack on the democratic process to some degree, right? Or an interference with the democratic process, right? I mean, uh, in the census case, <laughs> there would be fewer people who are being counted, undercounted, and districts would be drawn differently. Uh, that, that is an infringement on you know, democratic participation. And of course, the gerrymandering case is where he says, he literally says, look, w I'm, we're not really in a position here to make these decisions on political grounds. Uh, he doesn't say it, but he's really saying elections have consequences. Uh, one day the Democrats will win the state houses, and they'll redraw it again, but it's not for the courts. Um, Mark, you want to start with this? I mean, it is a disastrous decision. It is uh, misguided. It is dishonest. Uh, I think it is catastrophic to democracy, uh, and I think it's poorly written. Uh, but besides that, but you like it, you know. <laughs> but you admire it on other levels. Other than that, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Look, there's this there's this great line in Justice Elena Kagan's dissent, which I would advise you read actually before you read the majority opinion. Neither is very long, uh, in which she she points to all of these state courts and lower federal courts that have both gauged extreme partisan gerrymanders, decided that they violated the Constitution, and, and commissioned maps that fix the problem. And she gestures to them and she says, what do they know that we don't? And I think that's brilliant, because what Roberts is saying is, we can't fix this. And what Justice Kagan shows, objectively and empirically, is yes, we can. We have simply chosen not to fix it. We have, for the first time, identified a constitutional violation and thrown up our hands and said, we are not capable of fixing this, so we will let it fester as a sore on our democracy. Uh, and and I, I, I mean, I. I think it's very difficult to contest that. Uh, I don't think Roberts makes a serious effort at trying to. He sort of warps what the plaintiffs were asking for. They were not asking for proportional representation. They were not even asking for partisan symmetry. They were saying these lawmakers are going into dark rooms using partisan data to dilute the power of our votes because of our expression of support for certain political parties. Make it stop. At the very least, just rein in the extreme practices here. Everyone knows them when they see them. Just say these have gone too far. And Robert said we can't do that. Yeah, but I think it was interesting at uh, coming out of oral arguments because, oh, first of all, that Kagan dissent, which was read from the bench. Cheerfully, I'm told. And, well, th unfortunately, none of you will be able to hear it until next fall, but it's worth it to hear it because I've heard her be very passionate, and here there was real sadness. Right. And at the end, uh, in the opinion at the end, she said it was with deep sadness that I, uh, I, I dissent, which you usually just say respectfully dissent. But when she read it in court, she mentioned the name of each and of the liberal justices, and her voice did, uh, it was just, a, it was very emotional. She was sad here. But mm. at oral arguments, um, to push back on a little bit of your points, Justice Alito, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, uh, Kavanaugh, they felt like we will be here every five minutes. And if you were talking with Roberts, he would say, this is just what I'm talking about, that we are not the political branches. We're the legal branches, and I'm drawing the line. Now, Kagan says, this is when um, we need the courts the most, but he pushes back and says, this isn't our role. And so here you're we've talked about two of the most politically charged cases of the term, and we have seen Roberts on one side uh, uh, siding with the liberals, uh, and on the other side uh, taking into consideration uh, his uh, strong thoughts that this isn't a political branch. Hmm. Andrew? Um, I mean, the practical upshot of this decision. I, I mean, there are, there are certain people, certain experts who say that where, where gerrymanders are possible, um, they are saturated and it's not gonna get much worse than it already is because it's really bad right now. Uh, but others say, you know, it is, it is possible to get more and more extreme because the, the computer models are so precise and the voter data is so precise. Uh, and now, the, now there won't be any fear of, of court intervention, at least at the federal level. So I think you know, most experts, uh, at least that I talked to, thought that it will get worse going forward. But one, one thing that I thought was kind of surprising from Robert's opinion was, uh, if, if I'm not, if I'm, unless I'm misremembering, he was in dissent in the uh, case in in Arizona that challenged independent redistricting yeah. com commissions. But in, um, in this opinion, he's, he spent a, a good deal of time talking about how those are a possible remedy, state-based uh, bipartisan or independent commissions, um, you know, uh, cases brought under state law, under state constitutions. I mean, he, he sort of talked about these as remedies and in a, in a way that made it sound like he was supportive of those efforts, so I thought that was kind of. Hmm. Um, so that, I, I was struck by that too, and I, just one possible way to think about this case, I am also disappointed in the result. I think it's, um, it's quite stark and quite extreme relative to the baseline of the court's cases in this area coming in. So for 
some decades now, the court has said in principle, extreme partisan gerrymandering is justiciable. It's just that we haven't yet found a standard. I don't read Justice Roberts' opinion to say we still haven't found a standard. I read him to say we hereby declare that the search for a standard is over <laughs> um, and that there, there categorically is not, in the language of the court's cases, um, there is not a judicially identifiable and manageable standard, which, which I agree as a matter of institutional incentives sort of takes away any underlying threat that the court might intervene. Now the tricky thing here though is um, if, the, if the argument was that the court ought to intervene in cases of extreme partisan gerrymandering, then the argument was also that the court ought not to intervene in just ordinary partisan gerrymandering, that some level of pursuit of partisan advantage through the drawing of electoral lines would be permissible, or at least not a basis for judicial invalidation. Um, and what that to me really says is that whatever one thinks about the decision in this case, we're talking about one of those constitutional law questions that is fundamentally a who decides question. And the only real solution to partisanship in the drawing of electoral lines is a different institutional arrangement altogether. It's some kind of independent commission. Hmm. Now, is American politics nationally capable of generating that kind of institutional arrangement? Not today. Um, is any state? Well, yes. Um, and how much more of that might we see? I don't know. But at best, had this case gone the other way, the court would have said, we will be there to provide a remedy in extreme cases. Cases like the North Carolina one, where when asked, <laughs> one of those responsible for drawing the line said, gee, there were 13 seats available here. Why did you draw them so that, and, and, the, and the overall votes in terms of political partisanship in the, in the state are pretty evenly divided. Why did you and your colleagues draw this so that there would be 10 safe Republican seats? And he said, well, we couldn't figure out a way to do it to get 11 safe Republican seats. Um, and he, didn't he also say, I just thought it would be better to elect Republicans than it would be did. better yeah. to elect um, so that So maybe the court would have been available to rule that out. So what would we then have? We'd have a case where eight or nine, maybe that was okay, but <laughs> not 10. We would not, even had the case gone the other way, hmm. had any of the standards that Justice Kagan's dissenting opinion was, proposed, was proposing, hmm. had any of them been adopted as law, that would not have meant no partisanship right. in, in the drawing of electoral lines. And I think that's important to bear in mind. There's one more critical thing about that opinion, if, and we talked about it before, the difference between Kennedy and Kavanaugh. Absolutely. Because Justice Anthony Kennedy, for years, sort of held out the idea that there was going to be a standard. He, he never pinpointed one, but even last term, we all sat yep. there waiting and wondering whether he was going to pull the trigger and say there was a standard. Last year, they punted. This year, Kavanaugh replaces Kennedy, and he slams that door shut. So, so that is one of the biggest. Um, right, and not well, having I not having Kennedy. It's Exhibit A, right. I think. Yeah. For this was one case, and for sure, Clear that would have right, would have been differently decided. Um, well, not necessarily, though, right? But Kennedy never pulled, never right. said never. Right, and and, and Kavanaugh says never. But in in the arguments before they punted, like la last term, they Kennedy uh, was posing the question to both sides about th this very scenario: if if a state put in its law that we will um, right. we will redistrict in order to benefit this party. You mean so blatantly. So blatantly. Right. And, and that is, in fact, what, what happened. Uh, what happened. <laughs> what Trevor so, told us. And it came up in oral arguments. This yeah. term, when Kennedy wasn't on the bench, I think three justices went back to Kennedy's question, which was, hmm. he wasn't there, but he, he was. Yeah. Let's, let's move on to the, I want to talk about the American Legion, the 40-foot cross case. We have so many more things to talk about. This one, <laughs> this is so interesting to me. So this is the case uh, in which, in Maryland, on a, on, a, on, a, on a public highway, there's a 40-foot cross that was paid for and uh, erected uh, 100 years ago, roughly, after, the, after World War I. Uh, and everyone said that although it's a cross, it had sort of a secular basis, it had a historic basis, it's been there for a long time. And so the question here is, was this about a case? And in the end, the Supreme Court said, uh, that this was not a violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, even though, even though it's on Maryland land, even though Maryland taxpayers are paying for the maintenance of the cross, 
They're saying, well, but it's there for 94 years, so length of time seems to make a difference now, and that it has a sort of secular historic basis, uh, and so therefore it's not about religion, that religious freedom doesn't mean to be free from religious symbolism, and so therefore, and, and, uh, and, and so the question is, this, is this really a case that is ultimately defending religious freedom, or is this a different kind of First Amendment case that we haven't seen before? Well, it, it's, it's a narrow decision, right, by Justice Alito, his majority opinion. But oddly, the members of the court who joined Justice Alito's majority opinion do not agree on what it means. So you, you, have, you have Justices Brett Kavanaugh, Elena Kagan, and Stephen Breyer joining all or most of Alito's opinion. And, and you have the Chief Justice as well, but they're on the same page. Uh, all three, Breyer, Kagan, and Kavanaugh, write separately to say what, what this opinion we just joined means to us. Uh, and they, they come to different conclusions. So Breyer and Kagan say, we think this means if it's old, it stays. If it's new, we're not so sure. Basically, it's an old cross. It's been up forever. Like, maybe they made a mistake when they put it up, but <laughs> we're not going to go tear it down now. Kavanaugh writes separately to say, oh, this opinion that I also joined, I think it means nothing like that. I actually think that the age of the, of the religious symbol might not matter at all, and that, in fact, if this cross had been put up three days ago, it could still be constitutional. So you have this weird squabble within the majority. And there is also, I think, a, a, a sort of curious contradiction within Justice Alito's opinion. So he gives a few reasons why this cross does not violate separation of church and state, but two of the major reasons are, one, that it has over the years taken on new secular meanings to the point that its primary, primary message may no longer even be a religious message, right? That it's no longer a Christian cross, that it is a peace cross, that it memorializes World War I. Number two, that if this cross were moved or torn down by court mandate, that that could reflect impermissible hostility to Christianity that would be uh, in violation of core constitutional values. So just to lay that out for you a little more clearly, this is not a Christian cross, <laughs> but if it's taken away, it will send an anti-Christian message. I do not understand how that makes sense. I would love for any of my esteemed panelists to explain it to me. I, I, I've been thinking about it for weeks and I just don't get it. <laughs> Anyone else? Me either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we can move on to another case. Uh, I mean, the, it, I, I can just, yeah. add, I mean, if the topic is religious rights, I mean, the court, um, after the day after the last ruling, took um, a case on. Um, a Montana school subsidy program. Um, it, it's, a, it's a program that subsidizes private schools, and it was struck down by the state Supreme Court um, on, on the grounds that it violated the state constitution ban on any kind of aid to um, religious institutions. Uh, so this is, this is a case where it could give the, the justices another opportunity to sort of expand um, religious rights. They did so a couple terms ago uh, in a case called um, Trinity Lutheran, which was about a, a church in Missouri that was trying to access um, public uh, monies to fix its playground. Um, so I mean, it's the, these are cases that the that the court is very interested in and is 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 seeking out to um, potentially further expand religious rights. Aria? Well, so I would argue that uh, during the Kavanaugh hearings, uh, there was a big talk about how there was going to be a conservative revolution, and it was going to happen this term. And I think that that cross case shows that this term was more, I think, in some ways, a term of transition, as uh, Chief Justice John Roberts uh, was looking at institutional concerns. I think Kavanaugh was coming off the heels of that hearing. And, and when we thought about that cross case, there were a lot of people who thought that the conservatives on the court were going to scratch out um, precedent and set a new test that would allow more religion in public um, life. And I think that that opinion shows that that didn't happen because when I first saw it, I was paging through it. Okay, where's the test? Yeah. And there isn't a clear conservative uh, test there. And, and in you're fact, saying they could have done that? They could have. And, uh, and uh, for instance, Mike Carvin, who argued 
he was hoping for a new test. And you do see Kagan uh, saying at one point, there are some fine points in this Alito opinion. And so I think that that is um, uh, evidence that the court is moving in that direction, and next term is going to Look be out. a totally different story. But that one and Gamble and a couple of the other ones show that this term wasn't that revolution just, uh, you know. A, a and, and I definitely want to get back to that about what you think is going to happen next term. Let, let's move to Gamble for a second. Um, so the Gamble case deals, it's particularly, I think, relevant for New Yorkers, right? If you think about what Cyrus Vance is doing with Manafort. Uh, in bringing his own case, because uh, this is the double jeopardy case, uh, the gamble versus the United States. The general rule, if I'm not mistaken, is that double jeopardy doesn't apply if a state court, state prosecutors want to bring very similar charges uh, because they're deemed separate constitutional actors. They're sovereign for constitutional purposes. So it doesn't violate the Fifth Amendment if you've been prosecuted for a crime in federal court and then you wind up being prosecuted again in state court. The reason I mention New York is because we know that Manafort now has this exact same problem. Uh, in order to overcome the possibility of a Donald Trump pardon, uh, Cyrus Vance, I suspect, for one of those reasons, and the fact that he thought that New York law was being violated, immediately ran into court and said, look, you violated our mortgage fraud laws. And so this question come, came up uh, in this term. Uh, and the court essentially says what? What is it? How do we how do we understand this? And given this conservative leanings, one want to take this? Well, I mean, it, it says we're not going to change a thing about how we deal with double jeopardy. Uh, federal government and state governments can still come in and prosecute for the same crime, uh, and uh, we're not going to change that by a seven to two vote with justices Ginsburg and Gorsuch both dissenting. They wrote separate dissents. Uh, as I put it, uh, it, it takes Justice Gorsuch 32 pages to say what Ginsburg says in 12. <laughs> uh, and you know, they, they are basically staking out a position as kind of the libertarian justice justices on, on, on these criminal issues. They're saying, look, this whole notion of separate sovereigns, that the states and the federal government are different sovereign entities, you know, that's a bunch of baloney because the truth is the framers thought the people were sovereign and that all governments derive their sovereignty or their power from the people who were the sovereigns. And so what the court engaged in to uphold this exception to double jeopardy is basically wordplay. That's what Gorsuch and Ginsburg say. The majority says, well, we think that this is a decent enough rule that we're not going to overturn decades, actually centuries of precedent to scrap it. it. It turned out to be an interesting and less politically charged fight than I think a lot of us expected. And it was a lot less close of a, of a vote than we expected. But it was a moment for most of the justices to come together and say, in principle, we will uphold precedent. We believe in stars. Well, decisions. and I want to talk about, because we're going to talk about this soon, about the idea that we think this year was an attack on precedent, but not in this case. In this case, the right, the minor, the the dissenting justices came from two different uh, nominations. Uh, you're saying they staked out a libertarian position. I can't figure out for myself what is the politics of double double jeopardy, right? I mean, do, is that a liberal issue? Is that a conservative issue? Normally speaking, do you think that a conservative would say punish them twice, right? <laughs> the hell with them, state and federal court. You'd think that that might be. I, I just don't understand, and, and I think the fact that the dissenting opinions come from Gorsuch and Ginsburg is itself interesting, and again, it, it'll play out again here uh, with Manafort. Well, I think you do understand. Um, I think what this case represents is that there's a large swath of the court's docket um, where the sort of partisanship is at best an incomplete way of understanding what's at stake in the case. Um, that uh, legal doctrine is more likely to govern in those spaces. Um, and the court took the sort of conventional position by sticking with its long established uh, jurisprudence on this question. It's not unheard of for there to be um, unusual uh, uh, comrades in arms in dissent. Um, and as, uh, as you pointed out, dissented separately, but basically for, for very comparable reasons. But you would um, say this is a good outcome for this reason, that they were respecting precedent. Well, I'm an institutionalist. Um, I think the court uh, helps itself when it tends to follow its precedents, or at least um, accords a very strong presumption in that direction. There were a number of other cases <laughs> this term 
um, where either in a majority opinion or in a separate concurring opinion, um, the court or an individual member of the court um, expressed an openness to rethink precedents and a tendency not to think about precedent mm -hmm. the, way the way the Supreme Court in majority opinions like Planned Parenthood against Casey um, has described it in the past. And all of that, in my view, is dress rehearsal for abortion cases to come, among other things. I mean, we'll have precedent discussions in other areas, but there was a lot of jousting in area, in, on issues like the extent to which a state has sovereign immunity from suit brought by citizens in the courts of other states not the top of anybody's political hot button list. Um, but there was deep disagreement in that case over how to think about the weight of precedent. And the majority opinion by Justice Thomas in that case suggested to me a much greater openness mm -hmm. to rethinking and overruling precedent simply if you think the earlier decision was wrong. And the dissenting opinion by Justice Breyer said, if that's your test, you really don't have a rule of precedent at all. Right. If thinking that the earlier decision is wrong is by itself enough to overrule it, then you're not giving weight to precedent as such. That was just kind of shadow boxing this term around those issues, but it's going to be uh, center stage, maybe as soon as next term, but, but in the next couple. But how do we then account for the Kaiser decision, Kaiser versus Wilkie, right? Because there's another case, that's the case where there's longstanding precedent that if, uh, if you can't really figure out what an agency's rules are, it's better to let the agency figure it out than it is to let a federal court figure it out, yeah. right? And so in that case, they said, well, that's the precedent and we think we should abide by that precedent. So there does seem to be some confusion there a couple times in this, in the, in this term. Well, sometimes the court, a majority of, of the court will think that the earlier precedents were right. <laughs> so then they'll uphold them. Right. But that's not to say that stare decisis was the reason it was mm -hmm. upheld. Good. And that's, that's what we'll need to explore in, in a few in, in the Kaiser case, I mean, uh, Justice Roberts uh, didn't write the opinion, but he wrote a concurrence, if I, if I remember that right. Yeah. Um, and in it, he he you know he said it it's it makes sense to adhere to the precedents in this case uh, you know the, the idea of of judges deferring to um federal agencies in their interpretation of their regulations but it, it's interesting because he also said i think in a message to the dissenters who had said who had wanted the precedents to be overruled um gorsuch said that uh, that the, what, what resulted from the main opinion, which was a, a very constrained version of this deference, was that it was zombified and a paper tiger. But uh, Roberts basically agreed with him and, and said, well, you know, for all intents and purposes, that's exactly what happened. So, you know, what's the difference? Well, I, I think that one interesting thing this term was the Kaiser case and another case, which is Gundy, and that it's not as easy to talk about those cases as it is the Cross case, partisan redistricting. Mm -hmm. But what is going on at this court uh, is very interesting because uh, Donald Trump ran on the administrative state. And more importantly, mm. White House counsel Don McGahn cares about this issue, the conservative issue that he thinks these agencies and other conservatives have become too powerful, that it's become uh, burdensome on business, and the liberals are alarmed. And they're alarmed because, of course, they see agencies much more as protecting the consumer, um, um, uh, drawing back on business. So we had these two cases uh, this term. And what I think it's interesting is that when Kavanaugh, uh, when uh, Kennedy's seat was up, there was sort of this battle in the conservative movement. Some people wanted uh, Amy Coney Barrett. She was a uh, judge, and uh, those uh, opponents of abortion uh, wanted her on the bench. Right. But others pushed for Kavanaugh, and they pushed for him for this reason. And you saw here, uh, Kavanaugh couldn't participate in the Gundy case, but he because he, it was argued before he was on the bench, but he did participate in the Kaiser. And if any of those people who supported Kavanaugh or Gorsuch were biting their nails, fearful, well, are we going to get what we wanted to? In this particular area, they did. And that is of alarm to uh, the liber uh, liberals who are very fearful that uh, these agencies are going to uh, lose their power. Yeah, just if we could give just a, another minute on Gundy. Um, it's a technical case, um, but it, it is a really important constitutional issue, and I agree completely with your analysis. So this 
we teach this in constitutional law. This involves the status of something called the non-delegation doctrine, which is a doctrine, to quote the Princess Bride, that has been at least mostly dead for a long time. Um, <laughs> the last time the court struck down a statutory delegation of authority to an administrative agency on non-delegation grounds was before the famous switch in time that saved nine. So it was the early New Deal. Um, and there's an opportunity in a case this term for the court to look at that again. And so what this would do if the non-delegation doctrine were revived is it would constrain Congress's ability to delegate authority to administrative agencies to make rules, to govern in areas ranging from the environment to the economy, right? Everything from the EPA to the SEC um, and, and much more besides. Eight member court, because Kavanaugh is recused, the case is decided 5-3, um, upholding the court's current doctrine. So nothing is overruled. The non-delegation doctrine is not revived. Something called the intelligible principle test is maintained as, as a pretty easy test for Congress to pass in this area. The three dissenting justices say, we're ready to, to bring back the non-delegation doctrine. This, they, they are writing the dissent that, um, I think it's fair to say, the Chamber of Commerce is most hoping the court will adopt as a rule. Um, Justice Alito concurs, he's with the five, but he writes a separate concurring opinion to say, basically, I agree with the dissent. I think the non-delegation doctrine needs to be revised, and in an appropriate case, I would be willing to rethink and potentially to jettison the intelligible principle test. I'm basically with the dissent, raising the question, well, why didn't he vote with the dissent? If he voted with the dissent, the case would have been four to four. And the court has a rule that when it divides that way, the decision below is affirmed, but the technical description is it's affirmed by an equally divided court and nobody writes an opinion. There is no opinion. So think of the difference between that outcome and this one. In both cases, the decision below is affirmed. But in this case, we have four justices on public record to everyone who's regulated by an agency in this country saying, we're there, we're ready, to bring back the non-delegation doctrine and hugely to cut back on Congress's power to delegate to agencies and therefore hugely to cut back on agency power. They have made that public statement, which is in effect an invitation if you think that Kavanaugh is ready to provide the fifth vote mm. to tee up a case as soon as possible. And that's that tee upping, if that's a verb, is going to happen, I'm sure, in the next year or two. Ariane. But it also shows how these conservatives, again, not this term, but they're raring to go. <laughs> and in, if you see the last, one of the last actions that the uh, court took is it decided not to take up uh, an abortion case right. out of Alabama. So they wouldn't add it to the docket. Now there are others lining up, uh, coming next term. But Thomas wrote and he said, by the way, we have to take up abortion. I mean, he wrote by himself, but they are raring to go. And in that, in one of the administrative um, uh, law cases, Gorsuch says, well, Alito's not ready to go now, but we are. I mean, he's, he basically says that. Yeah. So he's sending a strong signal and almost maybe a tiny itty bitty bit uh, critical of Alito. You know, we're ready to go. And What's with you? Yeah. <laughs> what, yeah, Mark? There's also, just before we leave this, a great line in Justice Kagan's dissent in the Gundy case uh, where she's upholding the law at issue, and she says, well, if this law is unconstitutional, then much of government is unconstitutional. To which the conservatives her, her say... Her majority opinion. Yeah, right, her, yeah. Her, her plurality opinion. To which the conservatives say, sounds good to us. <laughs> like, we totally agree, Justice Kagan, much of government is unconstitutional. And you even saw some libertarian conservative commentators saying that after the decision came out, someone archly, but, uh, you know, as I think has been laid out here, so much of government is run by these agencies today, and uh, Chief Justice Roberts, the guy we've been praising to some degree as an institutionalist, signed on to that radical Gorsuch opinion, saying essentially that much of government is unconstitutional. So I don't know that Roberts is going to serve as any kind of moderating force here. I think he's ready to go, too. So this is, I think there's more confusion and also cause for concern. Last year, People said, well, no matter what happens with Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, no one's going to overrule Roe v. Wade. Uh, if anything... Who said that? Well, <laughs> a number Susan of people, Collins. Yeah. Right, Susan Collins. <laughs> We're saying, well, but we, want, we might see... By the way, I think last year, many of us on the, on, this, on the stage said, well, what you'll see is something more you know, insidious, incremental changes, right? 
incremental chipping away at this right to privacy, uh, dealing, dealing with this aspect of religious liberty and religious freedom, these new cases that deal with fetal laws, right? To see a way to sort of do an end run around abortion. I'm listening to the four of you, and I'm thinking, well, wait, we're ready to go. Uh, stare decisis is totally up for grabs now and, and under attack. Um, should we now expect that something much more radical than incremental change is dawning and that that's what we're going to be talking about next year when we sit on this stage? I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I do think that some of the liberal justices are um, worried. I mean... Are uh, what? Are worried? Are worried, yeah. I mean, in, in the... Uh, in the case about state so sovereigns that uh, Justice Breyer dissented in, he uh, he he posed the question: Well, uh, what's next? What 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 decision is coming next? What what are they going to overrule next? And and then Justice Kagan, in another decision, just six weeks later, that the that the conservatives uh, in a in a five to four decision um, also overruled a decades long precedent. Uh, her she answered Justice Breyer and said. Well, that didn't take long, uh, and and she posed the question once again. Well, what are they going to do next? So I think that you know at least the liberal justices are are actually worried about it. Well, I, another thing that I think has been astonishing since the Trump administration uh, took power, we've already talked about uh, uh, how early he was working on the Supreme Court, but Don McGahn and McConnell and Grassley. Uh, Republicans on the Hill, they're working on the lower courts, and they have um, put an un broke records, uh, really grassly worked hard on the appellate court level. So now you have a lot of the, the landscape below has changed, which means that the decisions that come up to the Supreme Court um, by some of these uh, uh, judges uh, could be much closer uh, to questioning court precedent. And you've got these emboldened states and these emboldened um, conservative public interest groups. So we are seeing these petitions coming up in a totally different uh, terrain. Before we start taking some questions for the audience, let's talk about which case, a couple cases that we haven't talked about. See if anyone wants to take uh, uh, the Hammond case, for instance. This is the idea that the preserving the right of juries to actually impose penalties and not allow judges to do it. Um, the, the liquor license case, that's one of my favorite cases, actually. I don't know how significant it is, but it is interesting because <coughs> it does make one question again, what, you know, what is the role of the Commerce Clause, right? Uh, do you think that's an interesting, is that something that we'll, we'll see? I'm not trying to understand what the implications for some of these cases. Might we see them again? Do they tell us something about this court? that could lead us to th rethink what might happen next year. So it, it, it's very helpful to constitutional law professors for the court to decide a case in that area once in a while because it keeps <laughs> things uh, <laughs> interesting in class. That's, it's, it's the aspect of the Commerce Clause that we refer to as the dormant Commerce Clause, right. or the negative Commerce Clause, the idea that um, in granting Congress the power to regulate commerce among the several states, the Constitution also establishes a kind of presumption in favor of the easy movement of commerce mm -hmm. uh, between and among states, and therefore that state laws that discriminate um, against out-of-state persons um, have a kind of uh, constitutional uh, problem and are at least um, subject to a level of scrutiny under the Commerce Clause. And so what, th what that case was about was saying that I think a Florida law, was it? Tennessee. Oh, it was, ten it was Tennessee right. two-year residency requirement in order, in order to, to have own, a liquor license. In order to have a liquor license. Right. And, and it was based on the idea that the 21st Amendment says that states have the right to regulate and distribute alcohol. Right. And what the court says is we read these two provisions together and your ability to regulate doesn't right. mean that you have an ability to violate another provision of the right. Constitution, right. just like the Commerce Clause doesn't let Congress violate the First Amendment. I don't think that's going to be very generative of new jurisprudence. Right. I think it's mostly keeping things where they are. Are you surprised? Oh, go ahead. I, I want to. And I just want to talk about Haymond a little since you raised it. Yes. Okay. No, I've gotten a lot of radio hits on this one, but I'm really fascinated by it because it's one area where I think Justice Gorsuch mm -hmm. does feel a bit like the successor to Justice Kennedy in terms of swinging really far right, but then. Yeah 
also swinging really far left. So this is a, a challenge to the federal system of supervised release, which I don't know if we have any um, ex-federal felons here. If so, you'll be familiar with it. Basically, we don't have parole in the federal system anymore. What happens is you get convicted of a crime, you're given a prison sentence, and then you're given after that a term of supervised release where you have to comply with certain restrictions, you get drug tested, yada, yada. And under the current system, if you violate that supervised release under certain circumstances by committing a new crime, a judge gets to just decide that you committed a new crime by a preponderance of the evidence with no jury input, and then is obligated to sentence you to years beyond your original sentence, up to a lifetime imprisonment, actually, with no jury input on, on, in this case. So uh, the court heard a challenge to that system and divided five to four, striking down uh, a narrow sliver of it, but Justice Gorsuch's plurality opinion um, assigned to him by Justice Ginsburg, who was the senior most justice, it was Gorsuch and the liberals, uh, really bodes poorly for this entire system. And as Justice Alito says in his dissent, uh, it is revolutionary in some ways. It is arguably, like I think he says, a 40-ton truck barreling down a hill toward this entire system uh, because it it basically says that the very principle of supervised release is probably unconstitutional. Right. That if uh, the, the US government wants to put you in prison for a certain period of time, then a jury has to decide those facts. A judge doesn't get to do it. And if that's true beyond this narrow circumstance, then really this whole system probably will come toppling down. Mm -hmm. So that is something to be watching out for because we could have Congress in panic mode in the next few years mm -hmm. because there could be a five to four decision with Gorsuch and the liberals saying that this entire system that they painstakingly crafted to swap out parole with supervised release, that actually they really messed up and that their handiwork is unconstitutional. Masterpiece Cake, are you surprised that nothing came of this again? Now again, we had last year, we talked about this, this was the Colorado case. It just so happened there was another Masterpiece Cake person, an Oregon person who's also a crafts person, a family, had the same position where artists this is not just a real a regular cake, this is a really great cake. <laughs> and so therefore, <laughs> I mean, this is just, this is so great that you can't force me to make this cake for, to, to honor this kind of a marriage. Uh, the Supreme Court says to Oregon, we'll just follow what we did last year, but we didn't really do anything last year. So go do that. Uh, <laughs> By the way, my understanding is that the same thing happened with the florist. There's the same, we make really great flowers. It's not just any flowers, special flowers. And so we said, well, just do what we did with the cake cake. And, but we didn't do anything with it. Why are we not seeing any answer after, after determining that same-sex marriage is a constitutional right? Why have we stalled here when it comes to religious liberty and, and cake? I would say that this is one of those cases this term where the court decided we're not going to jump into this one. We will, but we're not going to do it now. I feel like this was one of those times where they sort of decided, look, uh, look at it the same way. And it was interesting because the people bringing this challenge shot for the, the moon here. They wanted the, a really big opinion. They wanted the court to overturn uh, precedent. And at the end, they had to kind of say, yeah, we won. But they didn't win mm -hmm. what they wanted to win. That, that's my take. Do you disagree? No, I, I see it the same way. I, I, and I, in a broader sense, I don't think it's that unusual for the court to signal, usually more indirectly than directly, I, and as is the case here, um, that, that it's not looking to come back to an issue the very next term. I see. There's some kind of breathing period. I think this area of law, the sort of relationship between either expressive freedoms or religious freedoms as constitutionally protected on the one hand, and a state's power to prohibit certain forms of discrimination on the other, especially in the area of sexual orientation, is going to come back. It's structurally similar to the kind of tension between establishment clause values on the one hand and free exercise, free exercise clause values on the other hand that the opinion, the Justice uh, Alito opinion that you mentioned um, in, uh, in the Cross case raised. Um, and I think all of those are swirling. I don't, I don't, as much as individual members of the court seem to have been announcing this term that they're ready for big change in some areas like this administrative law area, um, 
I think there are members of the court like Chief Justice Roberts who's probably not eager to take up the first direct challenge to Roe against Wade and you know, are hoping that there'll mm. be some time. These issues will come back, but I wasn't surprised that the court um, didn't snap them up with eagerness this term. Well, speaking of Roe versus Wade, what do we think about this upcoming term? There's going to be a DACA case, for sure. Uh, there's going to be some provision of the Affordable Care Act is apparently coming up as well. Uh, I, there's at least, the, is it the Alabama uh, abortion case? There's something coming up, at least in that. I mean, I know well, that you, you signal the possibility that we may actually see abortion cases next year, as well as possibly affirmative action cases. Well, there's a tricky one, yeah. right? Because when Kennedy was on the court, he struck down, or he sided with the liberals to strike down a Texas law having to do with a doctor's admitting privileges. So lo and behold, another case comes up with that same issue, but it's out of Louisiana. Louisiana. Right. And so what do you do? And Roberts chose to side with the liberals and leave it in play, uh, leave it blocked for now. And I think that is sort of where things are. Now, whether or not he would vote the same way when the merits were in front of him, that's another question. And I believe that petition is coming sometime this summer, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. I think that that's the timing also. If the court were to take a case like that, um, it would have an opportunity to reconsider and maybe even overrule a recent precedent like Whole Woman's Health mm. um, without necessarily, if it was not inclined to, actually overruling Roe against Wade and to return to the process that the court had apparently been in the midst of up until Whole Woman's Health, which was a number of years of what many commentators saw as kind of cutting back on or even hollowing out the Roe right without directly attacking it. Whole Woman's Health was a, an exception to that trend, which had been running for a number of years. Um, I think the question is, um, Will the court end up with a case on its merits docket in the next term or two um, that will more squarely present the question of Roe's ongoing vitality itself? Only if the court wants it to um, will it put it on its docket. Uh, I think there will be vehicles for that. I'm not certain that there will be a good one next term as opposed to the term following. But again, less of a fear of overcoming just incremental change and you think that what we're seeing this year is a possibility that they would take it on much more directly and and say, look, star decisis when it comes to this constitutional question is something we certainly hear from Thomas and we've heard from others. This is something that I don't abide by. There are votes on the court to overrule Roe entirely. That's obvious. Are there five? I don't know. And there are also lower courts yeah. who might say, you know, they might push the Supreme Court into this if they were to... Well, that's interesting. That can happen too, right? right? Well, that was your point about the change in composition of the lower yeah. court. But you're saying that's the point. significance of that, and that they could actually force the hand. Well, yeah, and then it wouldn't be so much, you know, then it comes to the court. Well, and they sort of already have, right? Because this, this Louisiana case, uh, this law that sort of regulated abortion clinics out of existence, the law was essentially identical to a Texas law that the court struck down in Whole Woman's Health. And yet the Fifth Circuit, a, a very, very conservative court of appeals, um, declined to block the law and found reasons why it was different that were really bogus. And, and really, I think the court was in revolt over Roe. Uh, Kavanaugh was on the bench. The Fifth Circuit said, we are through paying lip service to Roe and its progeny, paying lip service to whole woman's health, and just said, we're not going to block this law, and then forced Robert's hand and left Roberts to do it in this very dramatic five to four decision. I wouldn't be surprised if a similar process played out over one of these total abortion bans in states like Alabama or Georgia. We've already seen uh, a few judges on the 11th Circuit, which uh, happen to oversee both Alabama and Georgia, write these concurrences basically saying that, oh, well, we think the medical and logical framework for Roe has been sort of overruled by science because the date of viability is different and we understand fetuses differently. That, to me, reads like they are preparing to find some pretext to just ignore Roe. And that would be obviously very dramatic, and it would absolutely force Robert's hand and sort of put him in this position where he has to give an up or down vote on whether he's going to abide by stare decisis on abortion. Let's take a question from the audience and we'll say goodnight. Um, perchance to dream. I just added that, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I just put this in. If we were to have a chance to elect a more liberal justice, 
who is an up and coming judge you think would be a viable candidate? So if, the, if in an alternative universe where Garland is just way too conservative for a, for a Democratic president uh, and that there was a liberal justice that would want to do battle with these Trump appointed uh, uh, nominees, these new justices, is there anyone out there? Because you know, this happens all the time. You know, we, more so you, actually know this stuff, right? Most people don't really spend a lot of time. I remember, uh, <laughs> I remember when I was at Fordham, someone saying to me, you know, keep your eye on Sotomayor. She's the next one. And you know, there were people who thought, that's where the smart money is. That's where it's gonna be. Sotomayor is gonna be an Obama pick. So I'm wondering, is, is, there, is there someone out there, if there was someone that we should keep an eye on? I know that this, the judge on the Seventh Circuit, right, is um, uh, Mary, what's Amy it? Coney Barrett. Amy Coney Bar Barrett, she used to teach at Notre Dame Law School. There's no question that when, if, if Donald Trump has another appointee, she will be considered uh, very strongly. So keep that name in mind. Uh, but on the liberal side, anyone that, who's been an up and coming that is a... I mean, there's already too many New York justices or New Jersey justices on the court that probably they would want some geographic diver diversity. But I mean, this is just putting this out there. I mean, uh, Judge Furman in the, in the census case, I mean, his huh. star has now soared. I mean, he wrote um, more than 200 pages, I think, on, on, in his decision. And uh, of course, he's been vindicated. That's such a hugely consequential decision. I, I don't know if that's going to place him on higher on people's list. If there was a liberal judge who said, I have a list, like Trump did. I have a list of liberal judges. I'm not sure. Um, th there are a lot of uh, lower court judges I greatly admire, including Judge Furman. Um, and I'm not sure whether my naming them in answer to your question would help or hurt their chances for the Supreme Court. Well, I'll Court. check with the Vegas um, odds maker. Um, uh, Judge uh, Sri Srinivasan on the DC Circuit um, is one of the most able members of the appellate bench in, in the country today. He would be the first uh, Supreme Court justice of a South Asian descent. Um, he's an enormously fair-minded judge uh, clerked for um, two Republican appointees to the, to the Court of Appeals, um, um, Judge Wilkinson on the Fourth Circuit, and then for Justice O'Connor on the Supreme Court, um, I think basically universally admired. Um, and so if one was looking for a non-New Yorker, um, <laughs> uh, it would be hard to go wrong with him. There are fantastic judges um, on the state courts as well. The California Supreme Court in particular has a number of really outstanding. And you know, again, we, we've lost that. Pot, right? we, 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 Souter was a state court judge. We don't really, briefly, Supreme, yeah. right, I'm saying? It's, Actually, long time on the state court, yeah, briefly on the first circuit. Right, but I'm saying that's something that people forget. You don't have to come from the DC circuit. You don't even have to come from a court. I mean, right. you know, yeah. Justice, Justice Kagan, um, whose role on the court has become just increasingly important with every term, um, Was you not know, a brings judge. deep experience and wisdom uh, to the job, but not experience as a lower court judge. Mm. Uh, yeah. I, I just love playing this game too much not to yeah. jump in. Uh, I have two. I have like a kind of a safety school and a reach. <laughs> um, so the safety school would be Judge Patty Millette on the D.C. Circuit, who went toe to toe with Kavanaugh when he was still in the D.C. Circuit on this very really big abortion case uh, and won, won that won that battle, um, got a lot of praise. And I, I think she's a wonderful writer, a great thinker and would be a great justice. Uh, if, if I'm really shooting for the moon, Judge Carlton Reeves. Uh, 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 in Mississippi, who is a uh, an Obama appointee, a uh, just a very outspoken critic of uh, Donald Trump. He gave this incredible speech where he described Trump's attacks on the judiciary as the third great assault on the judiciary in American history, comparing uh, his assault to the KKK in, in years past. Um, he has a, a robust liberal jurisprudence. He has blocked anti-abortion laws, anti-gay laws. Uh, just he, he checks all the boxes, and I think he's a towering intellect, and it would be a whole lot of fun to have him uh, on SCOTUS. All right, that's a good way to end. Uh, I want to thank you all for another wonderful Law of the Land. Andrew Chung, Mark Stern, Trevor Morrison, Ariane DeVogue. Ariane, I promise you'd get home tonight. You're getting home. Thank you all. We'll see you again at 92nd Street Y, Folks Events, and Law of the Land next year.